Hey, cold opening here. Um, for some reason, OBS could not find the file. And I don't have an intro. I probably shouldn't have one anyway. It's so boomer to have like a long intro, but it's kind of nice for the streams. In that uh, sometimes it takes a little while to know if like what's going on with YouTube on their end. So it's good to have a little buffer. But <laughs> you don't need like a minute and a half intro like I seem to run. Um, pranks, printing books, and meritocracies. This is mostly going to be about all the freaking wild pranks uh, I pulled when I was uh, in the printing industry. Uh, about half newspapers, half, uh, well, I guess you'd say books. More like soft cover catalogs and uh, TV books. Lots of TV books. Um, well, I guess the first play... Well, okay, here's what I'm doing with the... I suppose I should mention World of Warcraft. I'm, I'm going to check my stream real quick here. Well, it's going to come through loud. Oh, yes, it did. Okay. I think we're good. Um, what I'm doing with my mage, uh, I usually try to be in my location before I start streaming, but I had to change plans. Um, rather than just quest down in Stranglethorn Vale, where I've cherry-picked the stuff for my level already, I... Oops. God damn it. Um, I'm going to just go down to... Alliance. Uh, I'm going to go down to... Uh, what's that? Hillsbred Foothills. And there's a cave down there with some pretty densely packed uh, uh, humanoids that don't have a ranged attack. Because I'm going to do a little... Uh, herding. Gather them up, kill them. Now, I was down there at 31, and everything was still green and yellow. But now that I'm 32, some of them might be gray. Hopefully not many, if any. But, uh, it's a good place to just grind out some XP. And when <laughs> people come in there questing, because that's kind of brutal. They're just so closely packed together, and they all run away for help. And they run away at like 20%, so it's really easy to die in there. Heck, I died at 31 in there when I was farming. I just screwed up and wasn't paying attention, and a cooldown wasn't available that I was banking on. And uh, I, I got to, you know, learn the lesson you can only learn by having to run back. Um, I also... Uh, I'll show you on the flight. Um, I got a bunch of uh, frost damage gear. That, that helps a lot. Well, it could be argued just having more int and stam would also be helpful, but it, this kind of thing scales up as your you ask? abilities increase in a way that intellect does not. Uh, hope I'm not peeking my mic. I sounded really loud earlier. I'm getting paranoid about that. Well, let's see. I'm going to take another listen since I have a second here. Oh, maybe I should play the somewhere around now. Oh, I got a bunch of uh, frost damage here. <laughs> oh, the sound of your own voice recorded. Is there nothing? <laughs> is there nothing more cringy? Uh. But it does seem like I'm eating the mic just a little bit. I'll give it a little more space. And it's funny. I'm the guy who started playing golf and then went out and got really good golf clubs when he wasn't actually good enough for that to make a difference. So I upgraded my mic to the uh, to a used uh, uh, Blue Yeti. And <laughs> the amount of time it took me to get the same quality I was getting out of my uh, Blue Snowball... 
is longer than I'd like to admit. Because I just didn't know what I was doing with it. Um, so I'm a little extra paranoid about uh, sound right now. But uh, the pranks. Oh, wait. I was going to show you the gear. I can't show you the gear. <laughs> oh, well, this actually opens up another thing. Because I'm playing on three screens. And even though I don't really pay that much attention to the side screens, it really gives you a wider view of what's going on. And it doesn't appear that you can actually adjust field of view in World of Warcraft. So I believe I have it set up so that... Yeah, that uh, that's what it would look like. <laughs> Uh, that isn't really a very good, uh, very good for streaming. And if you were to stretch it out, eh, yeah, that, that gets, that gets really weird. Anyway, I think everybody prefers this, but, uh, it doesn't make it difficult to show you my frost resist gear when it's on the, on one of the side screens. Um, but. Uh, my first sort of brush with printing was when I was in high school. I had, uh, I had like a job, um, it's either on Wednesdays, or Thursdays, maybe it was Friday. Yeah, I'm thinking it was Friday. A at any rate, you know what? I think they did it more than twice. Not important to the story. Anyway, they, uh, it was a distributor for the Sun Times. And it used to be that Sunday paper was just loaded with the ads beyond what you could imagine, especially during the holiday season. Jesus. You, um, but they would pay you to uh, go in and, you know, they'd have like a palette full of advertisements, you know, lot, lots of different advertisements that had to go into different things. And you'd set up your station where you just like, you'd make, make a few stacks of the different inserts and then you'd have a stack of the section of the newspaper that had already been printed um, like a travel section or something something non that's not time sensitive and you would take the three four or five other pieces and kind of swipe across the top of them grabbing the edge of each one and then stuffing them into a am I even going the right way I am not <laughs> um, remembering stuff hard well, get, cut me a little slack this was uh, almost 30 years ago <laughs> yes old um but they would uh they would pay you based on how quick you were and then once i was out of high school they uh you could go in and roll papers which was basically the you know the papers come in on a truck because this this was the uh, Sun Times, and papers would come in on the truck, and we'd be waiting around. And then when they showed up, you know, we had to put them into bags uh, for the drivers. I know a lot of places drivers bagged their own. For some reason, it was separate here, um, and you'd all get paid the same, and you'd work until you're done. Um, but then later, you know, there were routes, and you know, people were trying to people who were bagging because you had stuffing which was really inserting but uh, and then you had bagging and uh, you make a lot more money doing a route and most of the routes you know this this the paperboy days were you know weren't really a thing by the this was about 93 92 um, and it was almost every adults in cars and you could, you could make some decent money do it, you know, delivering papers. When I finally, a route finally became available. It was in this, oh my God, it was like a MC Escher painting of like a little closed off rich community. And they had like two roads side by side with the same name. And you, you had, you had to kind of know the area cause the numbers would jump by, uh, like one four, no, one five and nine would tell you which of the two streets it was on, whereas two six and ten would be the other side of that street. Whereas three, whatever it would be on, it was super complicated. And I found out why I got the route because every one of them bastards 
wanted to have it on their porch, which is something people could have if they requested it, but by default, as long as it was on your sidewalk in front of your door, that was good enough. You know, I'm not sure I have the... Uh, oh, this wasn't where I was going anyway. There... Yeah, there's a good chance I'm going to die. <laughs> um, but the prank... I guess there there was there were pranks involved here too, but one of the, they had these strapping machines where once you got you know if if you wanted had a stack of material that wasn't going to be too stable and you had to transport it, you know you put it, you put it on this table and it would pull a strap over it and you know melt it together and you'd have a strap over it. But like if you just put resistance on the band as it was going through, you'd have just like a loop. Well, there were. There's no good way to say it. Beck created the theme song for most of the people working there. Like, if you were, like, young and stuff, you know, and you just needed a job, you know, it's not no shame in that. But it was dominated by old alcoholics and addicts of different varieties. And they would do this thing where they would create what they called dough traps by, you know, making straps. Because they're... They're about, I don't know, half inch, three quarter inch wide, and they're plastic. So when if they're the right diameter, when you step on them, they will pop up and hook your other foot. So you get them the right size. And people would often, like when you're waiting for papers to come in, fall asleep. And, you know, as normal healthy adults do in public, <laughs> you know, um, they would set dough traps up around people. And you just you just wait, you know. It was like a it was like a minefield. It's like, is he gonna hit it? Is he gonna hit it? And watch somebody get up and just don't. And it was always the best when somebody literally don't. Uh, that was actually a fun job. The delivery job. Oh shoot. The delivery job was was interesting. It was weird to have a job that. Um, I really like jobs where they're like, we need this done. Do it. We pay you this much. When it, it, it really hampers like your creative thinking and I don't know, just functioning as a human to get paid for your time rather than what you do. But, you know, so not, all, not all systems lend to that. I'll just use the ice block, get them all nice and lined up. Here's your walk back, Kona Cold. Get a Frost Nova. I've taken some damage to that. Get a bubble on. Try to hit them before that Frost Nova goes away. Otherwise, they just charge you. Yeah, I'm still getting the timing down. On the, uh, and usually if you do that right, you have enough time to, uh, get another Frost Nova off. Oh, he, he escaped. You bastard. <laughs> I am offended by that. And it's kind of nice if, like, you're watching shows and stuff, because it's like, you have a lot of action... And then you are going to sit down for a while and <laughs> drink and eat for a long while. Because, you know, it's nice being able to make your water with a mage. But, like, your water is always crap. Like, for you. But that is part of the game of, like, you know, giving you abilities that benefit other people more than you. Or at least as much. Uh, well, since I was, you know, doing the route on my own, um, wasn't really a whole lot of pranking going on. Oh my God. I just remembered. Um, I did do a prank. Um, I'd seen a movie where somebody used a cigarette as a fuse and you used to be able to do that. Now they have, I don't know what they're doing to it. So that cigarettes go out on their own, but you know, a lot less people die. So I really shouldn't complain. Um, but the, uh, you could use one as like an extended wick. So like if you wanted to have a firework go off, you know, like five minutes from now, you would just rip off the filter, shove the wick into one end of the cig, you know, light the cigarette, 
rip off the filter, and then shove the wick into the other end of the cigarette, and you have like a delayed fuse. And I cannot remember the circumstances that caused me to think this was a good idea, but uh, I had a bottle rocket. And I aimed it into the building from underneath somebody else's car, just in case, and went in to do my uh, went in to do my rolling, and it was aimed to go right in the garage door, and I succeeded. I succeeded in scaring the crap out of myself. I got in there, started rolling, and. I'd forgotten that I'd done the thing, so I was just as surprised as anybody else. <laughs> I think these guys stun sometimes, but I'm not sure. Might have just been that one. Yeah, getting stunned while you're hurting <laughs> does not lead to good results. But, uh, oh yeah. There were, like, people running out in the parking lot to see who was out there shooting fireworks into the building. <laughs> That's one of those pranks where you think it's going to be funny and then it gets really serious and then you never, you never tell anybody you did it. You're like, yeah, that was that was really weird. <laughs> oh, I just remembered another one. Like, this isn't related to a job. But I was kind of hanging around with some bad influences. And... They wanted to prank these people's houses. This is actually really kind of messed up in a way. And, uh... The plan was to drop a, uh, a pack of firecrackers into the mailboxes on the side of three consecutive houses. Well, I, I get injured pretty bad in this, so I guess that, you know, that's something. Um, so the plan was, you know, we, we would have eye contact on each other. And... Somebody's in here killing, uh, so there's it's like gappy. Um, so when the first person lit his and dropped it in and the second person would see him do that and drop theirs and, you know, so on. And I was the third or second person and the first guy did it. And then he like turned to go back like he wasn't sure it was lit. And I went to try to put mine out, but you know, I either missed my tongue or that doesn't actually work for putting out wicks. That's only in the movie, but I burned the crap out of my fingers, but we did make it to the bushes across the street. And watch the people come out like, I have never seen a chest there. And watch the people come out like looking at each other like one of them did it. Yeah, my timing was off. I'm just going to ice block to uh, get my Frost Nova cooldown back. And I think I'm going to blink forward on it. There's, is it always a good idea to hit them with the blizzard super early? Because every, every point, you know, every time you damage them... Oh my god. What a mess! Oh my god, I missed! Yeah, and these guys love to run. I'll deal with you later. <sighs> I need a target. But yeah. I'm glad I didn't hang around with those guys very long. I, I almost certainly would have ended up in trouble with the law. But I don't know, when you're in a group dynamic and you're like 16, like at the time, like I had the car, so like I had uh, I had sudden friends, you know, when you, it's like getting a pull when you're a kid, you know, <laughs> it like it elevates your status higher than your social skills. Um, <laughs> uh, should bring, so you end up like kind of getting led around a little bit or a, or a lot. Um, but the first actual printing job I had was I'd moved to a, a new town 
and I saw that there were there was a local paper or a weekly free paper, and that they were looking for inserters. And I'm like, well, I know how to do that, and I was pretty good at it. So I they had the place where you had to go in, and uh, I think that's the guy that stuns, or he has like he's got like stealth like rogues guarding him. <laughs> I'm going to do this first, then I'm going to do the story. I just don't want to pull the guy off the top, because I think he's the one who stuns. Oh, that's not good. I think I missed one of them. Nope, I didn't. That is satisfying. In a way that probably isn't healthy. Oh. I didn't wipe myself. Um, but they gave the, the address of where to apply. And when I went in the front and, that, and said I want to file an application. Really? How rude. I haven't been paying attention, but I haven't noticed any grays. Um, yeah, and I, you know, application, went through stuff, and then they walked me out. And I saw the inserting tables. Um, and there were actually people there doing it. But then she kept walking me, and I walked right, right past the tables. And they walked me out to this... Stainless steel, like, sort of conveyor table. And then introduced me to someone and said they'd be showing me how, how to uh, stack. And the job was stacking these little TV books that they were printing on this. Well, at the time, it seemed big, but after other machines I've been on, it, it was basically the smallest one I'd ever seen. And for if anybody knows anything about printing, this was a Harris V15 uh, with a quarter folder and uh, inline trimmer and glue lines. So you could basically produce, on that machine, you could produce up to uh, 48, I think 48, it might have been 24 uh, pages, uh, glued and trimmed and ready to go. Um, and I suddenly realized that, oh, I, <laughs> I'm a parent, apparently applied for a full-time job stacking, which I was looking for a full-time job. And I'm not sure if there was a miscommunication or whether the people at the printing company w were actively nabbing people coming in for the inserting job. I didn't really care. I had like a job that was paying more than I was expecting to get paid and it was actually full-time. And that's how I got into printing. <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of pranking going on. There were a lot of serious people there. Um, there was one guy that was really nice and he was like the, like one of the only guys that was actually nice to me, like from the beginning. And you have to remember this was 94, 95. There's, there's been a lot of, let's say social progress. And for, for a gay dude that was this effeminate to be in a testosterone like driven environment which printing most certainly is like like you gotta you gotta be a special kind of tough you know <laughs> and he was always positive he wasn't like passive aggressive at all he was just, i don't know he was just such a nice guy but the funny the funniest thing is like okay. there was a thing like all basically all the head pressmen did when like the machines weren't working right they would cuss it out and literally hit the machine. Now, these things were freaking many, many tons of steel. So you weren't, you weren't hurting anything. And, you know, they'd always, they knew the machine. They knew where they could hit it without any possibility of doing actual damage. And where to hit it 
that would make the most noise that would cause no damage. <laughs> um, I mean, like, God, you know, just everything you can imagine. And uh, when this guy did it, he would just like kind of like effeminately slap the side of the machine and go, damn it, why won't you work? Ah, oh, it is. It was the funniest thing, but it was like out of love. Like, like I don't know how you're doing this. <laughs> I, I'm different for less obvious reasons, and it's more than I can handle. I don't know how you're pulling it off. But uh, I'm trying to think any pranks we did there. Oh, there was the oil can prank. Oh, this, this is evil. There was a guy who, uh, I don't know, he, he liked to brag. And he'd, got, he'd gotten in this used car. I forget what it was. He thought it was really cool anyway. And he'd actually, like, you know, there wasn't, like, a rule about not pulling your car in. Okay, this might, I might, I might have bitten off more than I can show you. But I can't give up now. I never came back for that chest. God damn it. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna... Yeah, that's bad. I am probably dead. <laughs> I should just run. <laughs> I don't think I have the mana to pull this off. And I already blew my cooldown. If I can just buy to my Frost Nova cooldown. Oh my god, I, I almost did it too. <laughs> I deserved that. I bit off more than I could chew. Uh, I predicted I was going to die. But, you know, when you remove the chance of death, it's more boring. Oh God, I'm going this way. Um. Oh, and he'd actually pulled... It is his car into, you know, because we had, you know, dock doors, but we also had, you know, like, ground level doors. And he, like, literally pulled it in to, like, show it off. Which just, like... And nobody is, like, saying, hey, you got to get this out of here. Everybody's just kind of like... It wouldn't occur to anybody else to ever do such a thing. And... So one of my co-workers had this idea. And... Uh, was... There were three of us in on it. And what we'd do is, you know, we'd periodically go out and, like, have a have a cigarette together. You know, got, got something f finished, got set up for the next one. You know, somebody wants to go to the bathroom, you know, because um, this w these were three-man crews, so you didn't really have any room to ha not have anybody there. So, you know, take, taking group lunch and break was a thing. And... So we would individually sneak out with the oil can and put a little oil under uh, under his car in the parking lot. So as the night, and we were working night, so as the night progressed, you know, at first it'd be like, hey, is that is that a spot of oil under your car? No, no. And you're like, well, yeah. you know, it was, it was, I'm sure it was there when I pulled up. Oh, okay, okay. You know, a couple, couple of, ne next break, you know, I think that oil spot's getting bigger. No, it's probably the same size. The next break... Yeah, that's definitely getting bigger. God damn it. <laughs> like, I thought he bought a freaking lemon that was just leaking oil into the parking lot. Like That, that was a fairly evil prank. Uh, oh my god. This wasn't a prank. It was just something messed up that happened. Like one of them real... Like, like two of the f four head pressmen there they, like, wouldn't even acknowledge your existence by responding to words you said to them, even if they were, even if it was information they needed. They were that bad. And didn't, like, take, like, 
the only time, but one of these guys I did at one time, you know, when you've done something and you potentially accidentally injured something else, there's this thing humans do, especially, especially women to where your hands will like your elbows will sort of come together and your hands will come up towards like your face. Like, Oh no, like almost like the home alone thing. And he actually made like 80% of that movement. Because we had a, a vacuum shoot. And it was the way, you know, not everything you're printing is going to, you know, going to go to the customer. In fact, you know, depending on how, you know what, I'll take it. Depending on how, uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. doesn't take much. It really doesn't. Um, oh, the, the vacuum shoot. Uh, yeah, most of what you produce is, you know, depending on how long the run is, is going to end up being waste. You got. You probably have to run close to, depending on the complexity of what you're running. Depending a lot on the complexity of what you're running, you you, you almost certainly have to run several thousand before you produced more good than bad. Um. So you know, in, this place had this really cool vacuum chute. It's like a giant tube, probably. at least two feet in diameter, probably two and a half feet. And you could literally take a stack of these like soft cover books and just throw the whole stack in there, you know, and a stack would be about, uh, well, just think of a standard book, a stack of standard books. That's about a foot high. You could throw them in there all at once and it would just, suck them right down it was actually kind of impressive it took a lot to and then you know it'd suck it through the chute all the way back to this other room where it would shred it and then turn it into bales that got recycled um as you might imagine occasionally other things end up getting sucked down the chute <laughs> hats uh <laughs> i have more than one person i've seen them you know they're they're going over to throw some stuff in and, or they pick or to pick up something off the ground next to it and their hat's gone. <laughs> but in the, in the case of the guy, the, the freaking super asshole, you know, pulling a, a, a home alone moment, Macaulay Culkin, um, he chuck, you would often chuck a stack of books into the chute. Well, at this point, you know, one of the guys was down on the floor picking some stuff up out of the field of view of the guy chucking the books and stood up right into their path, hit him upside the head. He, <laughs> the asshole actually takes, is capable of empathy and compassion. And the worst part is it knocks the guy, guy's glasses off and they go, and we, nobody wore safety glasses. <laughs> this, this was 93, nobody, or 95, 94, something like that. Nobody was doing that. And his, his regular glasses just went through the air almost in slow motion and just got sucked down the chute. But that wasn't like the end of it. Because they were made out of plastic and not paper, it like made a clanging sound that just traveled through the <laughs> through the warehouse. <laughs> oh, I, I miss printing so much. It was so difficult, but so rewarding. It was like something you could get better at. Um There was another weird thing with the printing was that, like, they basically paid you to leave. They would, like, if you stayed, they would give you crap raises, regardless of where you're at. And the hierarchy was basically the, the people that load the paper, or I mean, I'm sorry, the, at the bottom was just the guy who stacked the product, you know, like the thing... The thing I was doing. I don't have enough room for a double. Um, the guy who stacks the product. And then typically... Oh God. And give me my Frost Nova. Oh, God damn it. Oh, and I got nothing. I don't even have a blink. Give me enough mana for blink. Mana for blink. <laughs> okay. Clearly, I can't do both of these things at the same time. Um, I will go recover my body. 
Uh, yeah, maybe should have quested in Stranglethorn Vale. <laughs> Still could. Maybe I will. Um, yeah, they. But if you like went, because there were, well, when I first started, there were four, but uh, later there were three printing companies in like the town that I lived in. And I'll just say I worked at each of them twice <laughs> because they just, they wouldn't pay you to, they wouldn't give you crap for raisins. It was so sad that this guy I worked with at the second place I worked, um, he was, he was, uh, oh, the third tier is the, so you have the, the guy who stacks it, the guy who loads the paper, and then you have the guy who uh, assists the head pressman, and then you have the head pressman. And regardless of what position you were in, they would just give you crap raises. I mean, head pressmen oftentimes, if they were putting out really good numbers, and they were kind of worried that you are going to go someplace else, they would work out these deals that nobody ever heard about. But uh, didn't find that out until later. Um... Yeah, they wouldn't give you raises. So you'd have, you you go to the other place doing the same job, dollar two more an hour. Sometimes you know more than that. Um, so I had to hop. But I I remember like after like eight years or something, I came back to you know one of the places that I worked before, and that guy who was above me was now doing the same job as me, but making so much less. And it's just, I don't know, I guess, I'm not sure if there's a point there. It was just weird that that was the case. Um, but the second place I went to, shoot, was it the newspaper? Sorry, I think it was the newspaper. At the newspaper, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a wild place. We did all kinds of pranks there. Um, uh, what was a good one? Um, yeah. The giant rolls of paper. Imagine like uh, a roll of toilet paper, except it's about, it's almost three feet wide and at least three feet or uh, four to five feet tall and weighing at least a thousand pounds. Um, oftentimes more than that. Yeah. You even had to have a special like forklift that had a clamp on the front to, you know, pick them up and move them around and, you know, take them from being on their side, which is the way, you know, you stored them to putting them um, on the rounded side or when you, whoops. Uh, needed to open them and use them and be able to push them around. And let me tell you, pushing them around, not much fun. Um, but one of the pranks would be where there was a, there was a wall between, uh, it was just like a sheet metal wall between the warehouse and the actual uh, room that the press was in. And it just kind of, so you could be standing at the console for the machine you know, for running the machine and like six feet behind you is, is warehouse on the other side of that wall. So one of the things we would do sometimes is take one of those rolls and, you know, you'd think it might destroy the roll to drop it from really high, but if you can drop it right on the flat side um, and it's not one of the heavier rolls of paper, um, never caused a problem to the roll. But when you drop, you know, a thousand pound thing a few feet behind somebody <laughs> they're gonna jump <laughs> it's like a it's like a violent sudden earthquake localized to just you <laughs> oh, you know what I never fit Sorry, just noticed something. Looks like it closed my window that I was using to make sure it was playing right. But it seems to be fine. Once I, you know, mute it. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing well. I think I'm just going to head back down to uh, 
Stranglethorn Vale and quest. Oh man, this is such a long trip. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I have not. Oh! <laughs> I guess I'll have to do it the old fashioned way. Um. Oh, probably. Probably the worst one. There was there was a prank that we would do where this this you know there was ink and oil like everywhere, and you could be really diligent in cleaning, but you know it was an old machine. And if anybody's curious, um, what was it at this time? It was a uh, it was a Goss Urbanite, you know, and it was it had stacked units, um, an upper deck uh, forward board, two folders, one for newspapers, one for commercial work, uh. One end that was strictly for four color, like it was, it was the size of like, I don't know, two or three fire engines. Like th this was a big machine. Forgot what my point was. <laughs> uh, what was the prank? Yeah, the little prank, the roll prank. Oh, um, there would often be just, you know, spots of oil, like some, somebody spilled or, you know, the, the unit was, you know, like spraying or, you know, whatever, you know, you, there would be spots of oil and, you know, the, the deck plates, which is basically what you would stand on when you're standing in between the units, um, it would often end up on there and, you know, you would get home and like, you, you'd have a, you know, if you're working on, if you're working on the black end of the machine, you come home and you just like... <laughs> Got brown shampoo water going down the drain but if you're working on the color end you'd have like a rainbow you know because you just get so much ink on you you can only get so much off at work and if you get it in your hair it's like that's not coming out to your shower um but one of the one of the pranks we would do is uh well often oftentimes um you know let's make this interesting Uh, you would, there were dozens of rollers that were supposed to, that, that in, in each printing unit that evened out the ink and water to a balance to where you could get ink where you wanted and not where you didn't want it. Um, and they required a lot of adjustment and the precision that you had to do this with, you know, and as r rollers would go bad, you know, how easily you can... Uh, how well they take adjustment, how easier it is to find the point where the thing, you can get the thing to do you want it to do, where you can make it do what you want it to do, gets more and more difficult as, you know, the parts age. And people pick up tricks and it's really common to be like, hey, I tried doing this thing and I can't seem to do it. And then you watch them do it. You might even learn something. And there was a, there was a real sharing, you know, if it was like, there was a real, you know, you you and your team against the machine kind of attitude. So there was no, there wasn't. I mean, it did happen in certain areas, but like for the most part, you know, people were cool about that. But you'd be like, man, I can't. This vibrator roller, you know, uh, next next to the ductor, it's. I can't seem to get it locked down in, in the right spot. I tried loosening up the other side, but I can't seem to find it, and it's just not picking up water right. And. The real reason you told him that that roller's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But there was a puddle of red ink that um, was kind of obscured behind something. So when he went in to sit on the deck plate and he went around to play around with it, he's like, oh, I got that. That was easy. I don't know what your problem was. I'm like, oh, I'm, 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 apparently I'm retarded. He walks, he's got this big blotch of red ink right on his butt. But then it got weird because like he didn't notice it and nobody wanted to tell him. And then... Eventually, we noticed he was—he wasn't like out on the line, and or I noticed that he, you know, you always tell someone when you leave the line and go to the bathroom or whatever, just so they, you know, just so they know. It's it's a, kind of a safety thing. So I didn't realize he'd left. You know, I didn't see him. I asked the other guy, and then he went to the bathroom. It's like, oh, I hope he's taking a crap. <laughs> guy comes in, <laughs> comes in. He is livid. He is just calling us every name in the book. And let me tell you, in the press room, the F word 
and the S word will dominate a sentence by <laughs> by the numbers. <laughs> and he he laid it out. I think I learned maybe one or two new <laughs> insults. So I was in there. I was just taking a crap. And then I went to wipe my ass. And all I'm seeing is red. And there's red on the toilet paper. There's red in the toilet. I thought I was dying. <laughs> oh, and That wasn't actually the plan. The plan was just make somebody sit in ink. That was just a bonus. <laughs> oh. There were two guys... I don't know if I should get into this, but uh, there were there were two guys who just like whenever they had the opportunity, they'd try to hit each other in the nuts with the wrench. And a lot of times you're, you know, you're trying to reach things and work on stuff and, you know, you're, you're, you're leaving yourself a bit exposed. Well, if they happen to be walking by while the other guy was in that position, just, just pop, just bump him right in the dick with the with the wrench, you know, sometimes a little bit lower, just. Although things kind of evolved with those two to where, like, I'm not sure where you make make the transition from, you know, just you know injuring each other in funny ways to playing grab ass, but eventually it got there. And at some point, I, I, it evolved to uh, those two getting a prostitute who I imagine didn't have a whole lot to do. You know, one of those situations. Um, but oh, what are some of the other pranks? Oh, the, yeah. If you, if you, what, what are the? Because we would have temps go through that would you know uh, be stacking the product because you know that was something for the most part you could show people how to do. And like you didn't really get good speed and quality for a while, but you could have you know temporary staff you know basically trained to. Keep up. Oh, and the guy fell asleep in his car. No, that wasn't him. The guy who, the temp who fell asleep, we just didn't wake him up. He felt, he he, there was a, a pallet of, you know, cardboard. And like, he went over and fell asleep on it. And, you know, what, what can you really do except, you know, just not wake him up, apparently. The shift ended at 6 a.m. and first shift came in and we said, hey, he fell asleep. They're like, okay, we're not waking him up. <laughs> they they called for another pallet of cardboard so they didn't have to disturb him. <laughs> and apparently around close to 9 a.m. he finally woke up and realized that like, his shift had ended like three hours ago. <laughs> but no, it was, a, it was a guy that we worked with that fell asleep. And this was at the newspaper who, uh, now that I think about it, I don't know how he didn't hear it, but uh, I go out for a smoke and I see, that I'm working with, uh, well, there's actually like five people, but like two of the people I work with are shrink wrapping a car. They're basically taking it over the top of the car, handing, you know, handing it to each other from underneath. And this is, you know, a two foot wide roll of shrink shrink wrap and the guy couldn't get out of his car when he did wake up apparently had to climb out the back hatch I don't know how he got that open um that's kind of funny yeah falling asleep you know it's, a, it's an age old vulnerability that, you know sometimes we can't help but exploit yeah see the thing here everything is Higher level. And there are a lot of, like, beasts and stuff here, but they're kind of... Eh. No, I'm going this way. Sorry, usually I have something better to do, but... I know watching me <laughs> die because I don't have the faculties to AOE herd and uh, talk at the same time. Wow, did I not buff up after that one death? Yep. Um, oh, at the at the commercial printing place where we mostly did like uh, soft cover school books and catalogs. Um, 
they had inline splicers. And, you know, I mentioned the rolls of paper earlier. Well, you know, as you imagine, you you have to, you know, change to change a roll, you got to, like, stop the press, splice onto the new roll, and then start up again. But there are several different designs of things called splicers that will actually, without you having to even slow the machine down, it'll automatically splice into the next roll. And there's a couple of different ways to accomplish this. But one of them is to have a series of pipe rollers on bearings. Um, basically two racks of bearings that uh, what the top one can be elevated and lowered. And what you do is you just go up and down like one of those dogs running through like those those, those obstacle courses where they're darting left and right that's kind of what the paper is doing but as you you separate the two the, the top and bottom uh, the area hold, can hold an immense amount of slack which isn't really slack because you have to keep it tight or bad things happen um, but it keeps tension on it while building up a buffer and then once it's got the buffer built up enough it will stop the roll that's about to expire and splice into the new roll and then get the new roll rolling up you know spinning up to, to the speed that the press is running before it runs out of slack it's actually a pretty cool thing to see you know the first time because i'd been i'd been in a couple different press rooms before i'd seen one of these but uh where the paper goes up and down over and over again um, you know, this paper has been heavily compressed and it's been through temperature shifts and stuff. There are a massive number of electrons that get freed in the process. And it's like just holding your hands over the paper in this area of the press. Later in the press, um, it's having, you know, it, it's going through rubber rollers and... Uh, it's getting, you know, moisture and oil and ink and stuff on it. So it's not, it tends, you know, it knocks the static down as it goes through the printing process. But back by the roll, it's just, <laughs> you can just hand, you, standing with your hands near the edge of the paper, you can literally feel it. It it, it can make your hair stand up like one of those, uh, they call it cyclotrons, Mag magnetic. No, I forget what it's called, but those things that, you know, the museum that you touch it and your hair stands up. It's basically that. But you can build up a charge in your entire body and then walk up to somebody else and just flick them on the ear. And yeah, it hurts, but it's also loud as hell. So that's a fun thing to do, but you got to be careful because if you overcharge, you'll ground out and like, like a literal arc will go from like usually the ball of your foot down into the ground and that hurts like a motherfucker. You're like, you're limping for a while after that. But uh, I guess you could call this a prank. Um, I was loading paper at the time and you would have to go get your own paper down. Well, he had somebody on another machine who was... Didn't look like they were going to work out and were, were having trouble keeping up um, and getting their own paper. And he'd try to get me to get this guy's paper down for him. He didn't want to make it official. He just, you know, he, you know, he was just like, oh, hey, if he sees me driving around in the truck, he knows if he hits me up. You know, and, you know supervisor types are weird. Um, so one time I was charging up and then got on the truck and then... I got off the truck and then I went to reach to get back on the truck and somehow I must have touched a different part of the truck because like I'd carried a charge over to the truck because you know you know rub you know rubber and a whole lot of metal you know uh, I'm not exactly sure how that works but essentially I I decided that every time I was going to go get paper down I was going to build up a charge before I got on the truck a good one and. I was driving around and he flags me down. It's like, it's almost like a moment out of office space where, you know, I would have liked to have driven around him just like, you know, the character in the movie he walks around his boss. And he's like, we should talk. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> he he's like, hey, 
uh, hey, can you, and you know, he would do that, like lean in on like the furniture kind of thing, but there wasn't any furniture around. It was just the crossbar, you know, the safety cage for uh, the, the clamp truck. And as soon as he hit it with his forearm, it shocked him so bad. He just jumped back. He forgot what he was going to ask me to do and just kind of like walked off like I'd like, 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 like a dog that had been kicked, you know, <laughs> like that worked better than I expected. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh. Oh, let me, see. let me see what's on the quest thing. Safe here. travels. Yeah, I guess I could do that. You know, I think there are some blood scalpers that aren't that high. I probably won't be able to herd them, but I think that they have ranged attack and stuff, so I would, wouldn't have been able to do that anyway. Um, you know, it's not... Oh, the, the other topic was... Uh, um... Hold on one second. Oh, uh, meritocracies. The uh, the commercial printing company that I worked for, it's like the closest thing to a, like I guess you call it a competence hierarchy, to where all that really mattered was how good you were at the thing you were doing, and if you were exceptional at it. It wasn't like people, you know, had committees and evaluations and, you know, they would evaluate your, your work and stuff on a point scale. It would just be, hey, he's not an idiot. We need somebody to do this thing. Just throw him in there. You know, it was never like a planned thing. It was always like, a, you know, you were, you became the least bad option. And that's how... <laughs> promotion essentially worked there and it's not like you just got it it would be like a lot of back and forth of you know the guy who's doing a good job stacking um the role tender like injured his hand um and and he's on light duty now the role tender can't do the job and the stacker really you know obviously can't do the job because he doesn't know it yet but if you bring a temp in while the guy's on light duty the stacker who already has, you know, like this working relationship with the role tender, you know, will end up, end up getting trained. And even if it's not like, but a lot of times it would just like happen once or twice or here and there, but like every, everything was like kind of a step closer. And it was, it was amazing. Like on my, I was on like the much more difficult to run machine. It was, for anybody curious, it was a Hancho Mark IV. It was a five-color. Um, it had a lot of toys, <laughs> but we 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 could produce we produced like magazine quality, like you know, like the best quality magazines you've seen printed. Like that was the kind of quality we could achieve. Well, that you've seen. I could see the difference. I could see how much crappy your mind was. But the average person wouldn't be able to notice the difference. Um, and there was basically an IQ cutoff. Like, if you didn't, if you weren't, like, at least around 85, you probably weren't going to be able to stack books. Because it wasn't just, like, take books from here it was there was actually you know some mechanical aptitude involved but most people even if they weren't particularly bright you know would would be able to get the basics but like there was a there was a point of like mastery to where the person like really understood it so well and once every when someone hit the mastery mo you know mastery of it nobody called it this is kind of what i'm describing it as now it was it was kind of obvious and that like they all hit the, like the same like there was a there was a ceiling of how good you could get at it just based on the physical limitations of what you're doing. And I think, you know, people would subconsciously recognize when people hit that. So when they were looking for options to fill other spots, it would just like, they would just subconsciously go to that. But if you, 
I, I would say you probably needed an IQ of 120 to roll tend because you had to coordinate a lot of different activities, plan in advance. There was a lot of precision involved and um, you had to do things that were a lot of very precise things you had to do fairly quickly. But if you were an underachieving, you know, you know, near genius level, like I had this one roll tender, um, he would spend almost half his night outside reading a book and smoking. Why? Because I didn't give a... As long as he took care of everything he needed to take care of and he was there when I needed him, I told him straight up, I don't give a shit what you do with the rest of your time. You know? <laughs> uh, you could go in the bathroom and, you know, I'm not going to finish that. Um, but what he did was, is he would get ahead, get everything straightened out, get everything organized, be there for, you know, the changeovers and stuff. And then... He would know that he would have this span if he had certain things in a certain place by a certain time. He would set his watch like a like a twenty minute timer, and then just go out in the parking lot and sit down on a box and read his book and smoke a cigarette. And he'd probably spend almost you know half of every hour out there. But that was just because he was that good. Another guy who was that you know borderline smart enough to be able to do the job, he would be like sweaty and exhausted after that same night. You know? <laughs> it, it, that's like the first stage where it starts to become obvious that uh, um, your grasp of what you're doing has an enormous impact on, you know, what you can do. And the same thing, you know, if you appear to be like... Uh, the sophistication of role tending being much higher than stack, you know, jogging is what they called it, stacking the books. Um... Mm -hmm. It's fuzzier because it's more complex, so you don't have like the same level of mastery. Like, you know, like if there wasn't level of mastery, this guy shot right through it. You know, <laughs> and it is you know it is a thing you don't see it very often anymore with jobs, to where it's like, especially like a lot of places, you'll have a workload assignment, and if you figure out how to do be more efficient and get more done. In most places now, your reward will be a bigger workload for no more pay. And that just kind of destroys, you know, grassroots innovation that comes from, you know, the people actually doing the labor. Because when they find out that, you know, oh, I don't benefit from this, it's kind of, I don't want to get political, but it's kind of the difference between, like, you know, socialism and capitalism. It's like there's a motivation structure that brings value into the system when people can benefit from you know what they're doing or indirectly um but to be an actual you know pressman press operator you know there are different names for the role you need to I, I would guess you know no no less than 140 which if you don't know the numbers that's like that's like you probably know several people at that level. There's a, there's a steep curve after that point, as I understand it. Um, and to be honest, I don't think you're going to find a head pressman in that environment that was less than 150. Like, these guys were crazy smart. There was a guy that wasn't quite there, but he was an expert schmooze, so he could get away with producing lower quality by schmoozing, you know, the customer you know, service reps and the people in the office. But that just gave him enough of a quality, you know, dispensation that he could keep up with everybody else's numbers. So, yeah, this is why it's not like a pure, you know, competence hierarchy because, you know, his ability to schmooze did have an impact. But, you know, it wasn't as much as you would see anywhere else. But, like, there was this one guy. I, I, I wish I could remember his name. I just remember him as like, like the hillbilly genius. This guy just, his just ability to grasp what you were saying so early into your, what you were so early into your spiel, you know, like, yeah, yeah. It's like, how do you know? And he'd tell you, he'd be like, how did you get that from that? He's like, I don't know. It just seemed like where you're going. You know? <laughs> I mean, what, what time, you know, something about the supernatural, you know, I guess I, I was going through a skeptic phase. He said, supernatural, Ain't no, ain't no supernatural. Everything that is is part of nature, right? So what what the hell is supernature? 
It was, it was like he he said it so much better than that, and probably more hillbilly than I was able to muster. But it was like profound, and it stuck with me. It's like, wait, yeah, somebody's proposing like this whole other thing. That yeah, at any rate. Uh, but you know, you beer drinking, snowmobile riding, you know, fishing, you know, like straight up redneck man, but like friendly and smart as hell. So it was weird how, like, and it's not like somebody prescribed this. It's just you had these. You have a list of responsibilities of things that need to be done, and they, you know, they 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 slope in complexity. But yeah, it would it would be years, you know. People, somebody might you know stack books for years before even like you know moving up to world tender. You know, I think the fastest anybody could, regardless. Uh, basically, I think the fastest anybody could move up through the system from the beginning would probably be five years, and that would be breakneck. I I did it in just a little bit more than that. But I also had the benefit of working with a lot of different people in a lot of different environments and getting a lot of different perspectives. Because newspaper printing and commercial printing are like very different animals. And then like web printing, which is where you're printing off rolls of paper, and cheat-fed printing are like entirely different worlds. And printing is dead now, like in my eyes. Like books and catalogs and like the things that would require a web press like i mean obviously they still print books but just not to the level they did and even in like like the was it late 90s early early 2000s um pretty much the only people that pretty much all our customers at the commercial printing place were archaic institutions like old companies that still wanted to put out catalogs because, you know, a lot of their population was too old to use the internet and, and education, educational material, because, you know, and the sad thing is still to this day, they're still making them do books. Like you, you can get like nice tablets bought, bought in bulk for like 50 bucks a piece, you know, that will do educational stuff. You're not going to game on them, but you don't need to game on them. Um, but they're still making the kids carry like all these books, like ridiculous. Sorry, sidetracked it there. Um, should kill something, huh? I'm just having fun talking about this, I guess. Oh, I should check and see if anybody's actually watching. I wonder how long I've been going. Over an hour. How about that? <laughs> Two people. That's about my average. Um, I am actually getting thirsty. Just give me a second. You have some extreme widescreen. I love having a mute button on my mic now. Um, it was really nice, like an actual team environment. Weird thing is about the head pressman in that place at that time, they were more powerful than the supervisor. Like, the supervisor was just basically there to sign customer samples. But even if, like, he suddenly decided that the... Sorry suddenly decided the quality wasn't good enough and the pressman thought he, it was, like, there were all these power games where the pressman would, like, start sort of, like, tanking their numbers a little bit and then, you know, to escalate things and then when they'd have the talk, it'd be like, well, like, I, I, I know what quality the customer wants. I've been running this, you know, I've been doing this publication for a while and I haven't been getting any complaints and now I have all these, like, new quality restrictions that the supervisor's putting on me and I just can't put out the same numbers with, you know, this... This interference and like, <laughs> or he'd just go to like the plant manager and say that. And then I'm sure there was some conversation between the plant manager and that shift supervisor that said, back off. <laughs> so like the head pressman like had a, had a strange amount of power. Um, 
in order to describe some of the pranking, uh, it's not, not even sure if it's pranking. Um, trying to gross other people out and making a contest out of it is a time honored tradition among men. And, you know, when you have strongly male dominant environments, that, you know, tends to come up. And as I was talking about the guys who were hitting each other with wrenches, um, there was a verbal thing that started evolving at this commercial printing place to where you tried to say the gayest, most, not offensive, but the most viscerally, I don't know, reactive thing you can say to somebody who might be homophobic. And I'm using the, like, you know, 1995 or definition in that there were people, you know, male-dominant environment, assholes, uh, people have been doing the same thing for a while. This is a place where social progress did not move terribly quickly. So... These were literal homophobes in that they had an irrational fear of basically anything gay. So, as men also do, when someone when you spot a vulnerability, you exploit that vulnerability. So, <laughs> just trying to say messed up stuff that would freak out homophobes kind of became a sport. And, you know, we'd do it on each other, you know, but like... The, the trick was, don't visualize what he's saying. Don't visualize what he's saying. Don't visualize what he's saying. Because <laughs> as soon as you did, like, oh, shit. You lost. I lost. Um, but a funny thing happened as some of the uh, old asshole, old school head pressmen, the kind that, like, didn't help with changeovers, which as a head pressman, you're not required, you weren't required to do, but it was kind of, kind of an easy way to tell who were assholes and who weren't. <laughs> um, a couple of them left about the time this, you know, this, this, this game sort of thing started. And it was a weird shift because they had gotten comfortable being openly, you know, like homophobic about stuff. Because there's a way to tell a, a joke with a, with a gay aspect to it that's funny because it's wrong. And then there's a way to tell it to where it's just a facade for, I don't know, acting out your, your own, your insecurities about your own sexuality in all likelihood. <laughs> um, because you can't, I mean, you can't be afraid of it unless you think it's part of you, you know, you, you can't have a visceral fear of a thing unless there's some part of it manifest within you. That's, you know, that, that's even how empathy works. But uh, as those guys left, there's a dynamic that shifted. And it was open game. Because like those guys, you wouldn't you wouldn't really try that stuff with. That was happening at like between like the joggers and roll tenders and you know, some of the cooler head pressmen. Um, that was sort of a thing that was going on. But no, nobody did it around the like the old school jerks. But then one of the two biggest old school jerks left. And like the dynamics started to shift. And like I was saying earlier, it started being like, if you, if, 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 if you had a problem with what, you know, two dudes might do on their own, um, you were in trouble because <laughs> we were coming for you. And it wasn't like some kind of justice crusade. It was just like, you know, it was a way to like get to really screw with assholes. Uh, you know what? I think I'm going to, I'm going to, in the stream on a, on a, I don't know if it was, a, I don't know if you call it a joke or a prank, but it made people so uncomfortable that I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do it here and then I'm going to end the stream. I'm actually going to get prepared to end the stream before I need to end the stream so I don't have that awkward thing at the end. But uh, I am the expert layman. This is Grinding Meaning 13 and here is the thing. So, if you, <clears throat> oh my God, I can't do it. <clears throat> well, if you woke up in the forest with, the with your pants around your ankles and a condom hanging out of your butt, would you tell anybody? Most people will say no. To which you say, want to go camping? <laughs> 